excited to see your face again, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you too. You too, guys. So, how's everything been since you left the States? Good? Yeah, you good. super good, bud. We've, um... Cool, bud. Uh, so, you're on a bit of a health mission now, is that right? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm definitely on, uh, trying to lose some weight and just get things back in shape. I No, I'm, I'm an open book. There's nothing. I... I <laughs> Trust me, I have talked about it all. <laughs> okay, uh, classic. Oh, I, awesome. I've, had, I've had shit thrown at me and everything else. So there you go. How's it going, Gareth? Hi, my man. Hey, how's it going, Craig? I'm really well, thanks, bud. How about you, man? Yes, I'm brilliant. Had a great day. How's your morning going? But it's going super well. I really uh, thank you for asking me, man. Um, Today we chatted to an amazing guy, a guy called Rick Clemens. Rick certainly is a bold mover. There's no doubt about that. And a bit about Rick, he grew up in a fairly conservative yet hippie farming family. And at a young age, Rick was actually molested by a family member, which in his mind was a sexual awakening. Rick knew that he was gay as a teenager, but when he came out and told his folks, they were unaccepting of it. So he basically went back in the closet. Rick actually ended up getting married and was married for over a decade. And he also had two beautiful kids. Basically 13 years or so into the marriage, he had to come clean and stop living his lie. And he came out of the closet for the second time. These days, Rick is a keynote speaker. He's a bold move expert. He's a status quo disruptor. He also works as a coach and he's the host of a very successful podcast called the Life Uncloseted Podcast. And in this conversation, we got through some very interesting topics. Hey, Craig. Yeah, that's right, Gareth. Uh, an interesting topic was this curious intersection where abuse and sexual awakenings are interwoven we got into how to get from a confused uh, state in one's life to extreme clarity the societal pressures to lie about one's sexual preferences even in this day and age which is crazy how an encounter with one person can change one's whole life trajectory and what it's like to live a life for decades of one's life. We also hear a how to live one's life bold and uncloseted. Hey, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely, Craig. A very interesting chat indeed. And if you guys are enjoying our podcast, we really would appreciate if you went along to Facebook to join our Facebook group. We have a very interesting group that go, there's a lot of conversations that go on there. And if you just go onto Facebook, you type in ridiculously human podcast group, uh, you'll find us. We will then accept your request and you can join in the conversations that are going on there. And also then moving on to the chat, as a result of speaking to Rick, we kind of did a bit of self-analysis and we were thinking that we need to make a bit of a bold move ourselves, And that bold move for us is to basically express our opinions more honest, honestly. We feel that sometimes we've probably just tried to, you know, appease the crowd and we probably sit on the fence a little bit uh, when it comes to our thoughts, basically because we just like to keep the status quo. And we definitely want to change that moving forward. Don't we, Craig? Yeah, that's right, Gareth. Um, you know, we feel that to create good conversation, there needs to be and. Uh, there always will be many sides to a story and Rick in this case is and has been through so much in his life and some of the most tough and challenging emotional times. And as it is with any emotionally charged situation, it's important to remember that there are always three sides to any story. Uh, and this is Rick's story that we're going to tell today. So let's hear now what it means for Rick Lemons to be ridiculously human. Awesome. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the cool stuff. Well, 
Good afternoon there, Rick Clemens from sunny California. How are you doing today, my man? I'm awesome, and it is, I'm checking. I, yeah, I think it is sunny out there. It was cloudy this morning, but now it's sunny finally. <laughs> so the joys of living close to the beach, you get the morning fog, so. Yeah, oh, nice. that's How cool. How far away from the beach are you? Uh, about five miles at the most, so nice. not too far. Yeah, we, cool. we can we can pop over there in about five, 10 minutes and be at the beach, so can't complain. Oh, how good. So, uh, so Rick, yeah, you're a man known for bold moves, that's for sure. And your strap line is a bold move is a terrible thing to waste. Yeah. And um, we had the, you know, we were fortunate enough to meet you uh, recently in Philadelphia at the podcast mm -hmm. movement. And yeah. yeah, we're just so thankful, like, you know, well, to meet you, first of all, because you're such a, an amazing character with a really interesting story. And it's nice that you, you know, you agreed to come on our podcast now. So thanks very much. Oh, it was great meeting you guys too. I love those. I love those moments where you go somewhere and you know, you're going to meet people, but then when you have a connection and that connection's like, Hey, this is actually something that really is valuable to everyone concerned. So I'm just glad we had that opportunity as well. Yeah, yeah. totally. And, uh, and, uh, was, he's a very good, uh, interlocutor and a, and a, and a good networker. And he's just a, he's such a good guy as well. So it was really nice to have met you through him as well. So we're just grateful to him as well. It was really, yeah. really cool. Yeah. He's a good guy. And one, one funny thing, I'm not too sure if you remember, but I, when I first met you, I looked at you, I was like, you remind me of somebody. <laughs> and, uh, and you're like, Oh, I get this all the time. It's uh, it's this person, this person. And I completely forgot who you said it was, but now I know who the, who the person I think it is that you remind me of, right? Okay, so and who is that? It's a guy called James Avery. Oh, uh, that's I don't a new know, one. I don't know if you, I don't know if you know him, <laughs> but uh, he's uh, the guy from French, Fresh Prince of Ballet. Um, he's mm. the big dad. Um, okay. So he's yeah. your your black lookalike, but <laughs> yeah, uh, but I haven't honestly, heard that one before, but that makes sense. Honestly, makes sense. I, I like now. I'm like that is exactly who it is. <laughs> mm, gotcha. But Rick, yeah, so you, I, you told us a story how you walked into your your doppelganger that you remember as well, or that you've yeah. heard before as well. Tell us that story. So it's interesting. I, I get told a lot that I look like Vincent D'Onofrio um, of LA or not LA law, but um, yeah, LA law and then um, full metal jacket. So everybody used to say, Oh, you're the guy from full metal jacket. I'm like, I've never seen that movie. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then somebody finally said it's Vincent on LA law. I went, oh, I get that law on LA law and order. I'm like, okay, cool. I get that. I, you know, I, I'm like, I know who that is. And, um, it was just kind of interesting because I was walking down the street one time in LA and I was there meeting with clients and you just kind of hang out. I was in West Hollywood, Hollywood area. And I came around the corner and he was walking towards me and we just both kind of looked at each other like, okay, so yeah, this is really, you know, and it was just, it was just one of those moments. And I try not to be Mr. My, well, my husband would disagree with me that I try not to be Mr. Celebrity, you know, oh my God. Um, but that was one of those moments I'm like, I'm keeping it cool. I'm keeping it real here. And we just kind of walk past each other. And then almost like, you know, the whole dating thing, like when you like see a really good looking gal, in my case, a really good looking guy and you do the pass in, on the street. And it's like, it's the count one, two, three, then look over the shoulder. That's what happened. And um, it was so funny because I looked over my shoulder and he looked over my shoulder and we just kind of nodded at each other and we just kept going. And I'm like, okay, that was pretty amazing. That was pretty cool. So, uh, yeah. So it would know, be interesting to have had a conversation, but um, I think that was that moment. You're like, yeah, everybody says you have a twin and uh, okay, there he was. Yeah, <laughs> he knew it and you knew it. It was a yeah, doppelganger yeah, moment. Yeah. yeah, and there's times that we really look a lot alike depending on what character he's playing. And then he, he actually has more hair than I do. So that's when he doesn't look like me at all. <laughs> it's all good. I, I warn him, I'm like, your day's coming, honey. Trust me, that hair is going to go away one of these days. So uh, yeah. That's oh, what all yeah, bald guys say though, I think, Rick. Hey. Well, I think for some, I mean, we, we so it's kind of like gay men, we can catch, you know, we can spot other gay men in a crowd, us bald guys can like, yeah, you know what, that beautiful little shag on your head, it's going to go away. But we can spot the ones who are going to lose it. The other ones are like, yeah, we hate you, asshole. You've got way too much good looking hair. So. <laughs> so, so what do you reckon about Craig? He's got quite a high, like, you know, uh, so uh, like you know, this is not know, going anywhere, buddy. 
I, I, well, okay. I don't want to burst your bubble, but you know, I, I think you're going to be surprised. <laughs> oh my God. Don't tell me this. Don't tell me this. This is some people have a nice smooth pip like yourself and mine yeah, yeah. is certainly not. So I think there's, that's the unfortunate thing. I'm glad well, I have hair. Just, right. Actually, you know what? Just go look at your mom's side of the family and their story will be told. So there you go. Oh my God. Okay. But see, unfortunately <laughs> my mom's side of the family, I couldn't tell because she was adopted. So I'm still looking for, you know, those great grandparents like, okay, who did this shit to me? So. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, so, so Rick, uh, I guess while, you know, when you mentioned your mom there, um, you certainly have a, a really interesting story and, also um, an interesting upbringing. And when we, we, we do a storyboard for everybody and uh, you know, yours is, is long and very interesting. And when you filled in some of the gaps for us, you said that you're from Loveland in Colorado. Right, <laughs> we almost right. thought you were joking because of your whole story. It kind of like really adds to it. You know what I mean? Um, no, it's a real place. It is. <laughs> it is. So, so do you just want to give us like a little bit of a sort of overview of your childhood and upbringing, um, you know, in Loveland, Colorado? Sure. So just like Jesus, I was divinely, you know, brought into the world, you know, my mom <laughs> really didn't have any, you know, things to do with my dad. No, that's not true. Um, actually my parents were married very young. Um, <clears throat> my mom was 17 when she had me and, um, we were only in Colorado for a very short time before we moved to California. And, um, it was really interesting growing up because I always had these roots in Colorado because my grandfather, um, all my family is all my family is from Colorado, but a lot of them migrated to California. And then when I was like four year or fourth grade, we moved back to Colorado and um, my parents were hippies and, you know, seventies flower children, all this stuff, even though they'd never admitted in this day and age, but that's what they were. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so we get back to the farmland and I don't know, it was like where the roots finally really took hold for me. It's like, wow, this is kind of, this is what I, this is where I'm supposed to be. And um, I actually went to a one room schoolhouse. Most people are like, seriously, I'm like, yep, one room schoolhouse. It was me and like 25 other kids, 26 other kids from all age ranges, all grades. Wow. And um, worked on the farm with my grandfather. And um, it gave me a whole lot of just grounding even to this day i feel grounded when i think about colorado uh, i can't see myself ever living there again but it, it's definitely where my roots are and even to this day our family still has roots there from a um, financial perspective we we own a lot of land and stuff there so it's just i don't know there's something about it my grandfather was one of the people in my life that i highly respect and um, miss greatly he's no longer with us um, but he taught me a whole lot about life and being who you are and truly living by living by your standards to be who you're meant to be. Um, he was a farmer and he lived on that farm for like 40, 44 years and just an amazing man. And then some interesting stuff happened and brought him into a lot of money because of the land that he owned and he never changed, not one bit. And um, <clears throat> that's one of the people in my life when people say, who do you admire most? Who, who are the people that you most would say has influenced your life? It's my grandfather. And wow. um, yeah, those were some interesting years in life. Definitely um, growing up. So interesting, my parents, I joke about it. It's like, my parents made some of the worst moves in life, but I'm so glad they did. They lived in the Napa Valley. Right before the Napa Valley really became something. They had the opportunity to own a home there, and they didn't take advantage of it. So then we moved to Colorado, and they moved into the Colorado area. My dad was working in Aspen. Before Aspen ever became anything, they could have had the opportunity to buy something there, and they didn't. So, you know, <laughs> my whole life inheritance is because my parents really screwed up along the way. But God love them. <laughs> They're all good now. So, uh, so, yeah, that's part of the journey. And then... The twists and turns started. We moved all over the place, and people were like, "Oh, are you? Was your dad in the military?" No, my dad was in construction, so he would move to where building booms were happening and things such as that. And we moved from Colorado to Arkansas to Oklahoma. By then, I was in college and stuff, and high school, and so I went to high school in Arkansas, college in Tennessee, college in Oklahoma. Lived in Oklahoma for a little while before, once I got married to my wife. Um, then we made the move back to California 
and been in California ever since. I, I literally consider California home. I've been here so long on two different times in my life that I really consider California the home home. I consider Colorado where my roots are. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you a question about your grandfather. I found that really interesting. Uh, and it's the bonds we have with our grandparents often mm-hmm. either very strong or very weak. Is, right. is this the grandfather that um, adopted your mom? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so why did they adopt? Uh, and are they, uh, did they, did you spend a lot of time on the farm and doing stuff, helping him around at the farm as well? Oh yeah. So the, that's the inevitable question that, um, I don't know that we've ever gotten the really true answer to why they adopted. Um, there was my mom and her brother. <clears throat> and I, I would say the closest I can get to the answer to that is I don't think my grandmother ever really wanted to bear children. I think she wanted children, but I just don't think she wanted to bear children. And she came from a really huge family. So I think there's some stuff there that was probably, you know, she was a, one of eight or nine kids. Uh, I believe that there was also a piece of, they were very, very beautiful, grounded people. So I think they may have decided, you know what, let's adopt children because there's children that need homes. And I think that was part of it for them. Um, and as far as spending time with my grandfather, yes, in an innate amount of time, sometimes I hated it. It's like, I don't want to stack the hay. No, I don't want to work in the garden. No, I don't want to go pick bushels of apricots for, you know, 25 cents a basket, grandpa. But uh, because of him and because of that time, I know even now there's things I appreciate, appreciate about life because he was... Um, you hear people say the salt of the earth. You hear people talk about people who are just amazing people. And I remember when I <clears throat> gave a eulogy at his funeral, the one thing that I always maintain about him is, quite honestly, if, if there is a heaven and there is a hell and if there is an eternity and he doesn't get in the door, I don't stand a chance in hell. Because <laughs> that man is an amazing individual. I never heard him once say anything negative about anybody. I never heard him raise his voice, except one time I did. And it was very, I understand the circumstances around that. I never heard him and my grandmother fight. Uh, hmm. There's just so much about him that he, he was very well respected in his community. He was respected in his church. And even when, you know, we'll get to the part where life changed for me, when that part of my life showed up, even though he and I never talked about the change in who I was, quote, change in who I was. I'm trying not to give too much away <laughs> too early in this. Um, he never confronted me and he never made me feel less than. And we'll get to that part of the story. But um, yeah, that's why I respect the man so much. Wow. Sounds like a special person. I always have, uh, you know, uh, like so much admiration for people that, never kind of raise their voice and always really mm-hmm. calm and just treat people with the utmost sort of respect and yeah. kindness. I, w- I wish some of that would have <laughs> rubbed off on me when I'm yelling at my kids, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing. It is amazing. And, you know, to see that I remember one of my most vivid memories of going back for his funeral was uh, I had to go to the funeral home for something. I was taking care of something and I walked in and the gal that was there, a small, small community. I mean, where they lived was very small. It was definitely one of those that kind of everybody does know everybody. And I walked in and she goes, you're Ed's grandson. And I'm like, okay. And she goes, no, I remember you when you were a little boy. And she goes, I just remember your grandfather being the kind of person that no matter where anybody was in their life, he met him right there where they were. Wow. And she goes, I remember watching him with kids. I watched him with adults. And he's one of the few people in our community that I can honestly say he only wanted the best for everybody. And he'd do whatever he needed to do to help them be that best. And this was a complete stranger to me. I don't remember this gal, you know, but just to have that moment and that conversation uh, said a whole lot about who he was. Yeah. Wow. Uh Sounds like a very special man. Mm-hmm. Was it a religious upbringing? For me, yes. Yeah. Um, 
yes and no. <laughs> this is where the story starts to get interesting. Um, when I was younger, yes, I was, I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. And I remember in my younger years, yeah, we'd go to church and church was kind of the thing we did. And we lived in the Napa Valley and a lot of my dad's brothers and sisters were there. Everybody was involved in church. My family was kind of the rebels in that arena. We'd show up, we'd go to the, you know, Saturday is when they go to church. So we go to Sabbath school instead of Sunday school. And we'd go to Sabbath school and my parents would be like, yeah, we're not going to stay for church. Or we'd go to church and we wouldn't go. So we were kind of the flexible ones in it. Um, we did a lot of things that were in alignment with the church. And that was cool. It was like, okay, I get it. I never felt this impending, oh my God, I'm a horrible person because of, you know, beliefs and stuff like that until I started to get older. And then it's when I started feeling things sinking in, it's like, wow, these roots go pretty deep. And that's when some of the conflict started coming up for me as to who I was and could I be this? And there was a lot of conflicting things that started to show up with my beliefs versus what I saw and how I wanted to be in the world versus how I saw the church and I saw people in the church, which I think is common in many, many religions. You know, suddenly you, as a kid, you don't see this stuff, but when you finally get to that stage where I call it, it's the living life on your terms stage, then you start to explore. And I started exploring in a little bit in high school, but really once it was off to college, I started exploring every kind of faith under the sun, everything from Catholicism to Buddhism. Um, <clears throat> my favorite was St. Mattress. I just stay in bed and not go to any church whatsoever. It's like, <laughs> hey, it's time to just sleep it off. Let's not do anything, you know? Um, but I'm glad I did because it gave me the openness to question and become curious which is a huge part of the work that I do now with people is encouraging them to move out of the confusion state and into the curiosity state. No matter where you start, any big transition, transformation in life that you're going through, it all starts with confusion. And you're never going to get past that. You're never going to get to the courage, the confidence, any of that stuff, unless you go into the curiosity phase. And Trust me, I practice the curiosity phase <laughs> almost every day right now. So um, on all my life. And that's what helped me begin to move into the space to find myself was I continually kept being very, very curious and challenging values and beliefs. And let's get into it. Eh? You, you talk about a confused state. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that as a youngster, you enjoyed playing the piano. And I guess one of your first vivid memories was having a crush on somebody. Um, and yeah, let's take it from there. You know, it, it's, it's really interesting because things began to happen <clears throat> um, as early as age five and six. And there was some um, awakening that happened for me prior to the piano stuff but I still have this very vivid memory of when we moved to Colorado and I was, um, I want to say that's when I really officially started taking piano lessons. I think I may have been taking them a little bit in California, but I know I must've been doing some because I wouldn't have just started in Colorado because I was far enough along that I could actually play really pretty well. And I loved my piano teacher. She was an amazing woman but there was something about her husband. There was just something about her husband that when he would be there, when I'd go to lessons or if he'd be coming home when I was leaving lessons, it was like, wow, there was something about this guy. And I don't know at that point in time, if it was just, he represented something that I wasn't seeing in my own father, which I think is part of it. Um, which was a very rough time in life in Colorado with my parents, a lot of alcoholism going on, a lot of, different things in their lives, infidelity and stuff. Um, it wasn't a pretty time in life. So it could have been part of that, but there was definitely something about him that I remember somebody at school, we were doing spelling, you know, spelling quizzes and things like that. <laughs> and the word handsome came up on my list. I'm like, Oh, well, I've heard people use this word, but what does it really mean? And I remember looking it up in the dictionary and then learning to spell it. And then the next time I went to piano lesson, he was there getting ready to leave. And that's when I really understood what handsome meant. 
there was something that just lit up inside me. I'm like, oh, I get this. And um, I think that was the beginning of starting the true exploration that I wanted to start. Um, prior to that, there was some exploration that I went through with another person. And when I talk about this, I don't consider it, I do put it in the umbrella of sexual abuse, but I don't consider it that. I consider it a sexual awakening and kind of a, oh, I get this now, why I feel the way I do. And that happened prior to Colorado, and then I get to Colorado, and I understand this thing about my piano teacher's husband, and then there were things about some of the guys in my little teeny tiny one-room schoolhouse, um, some of the farm community guys. Maybe that's why I have this pension for cowboys. I, I have no idea, but <laughs> that could explain part of it. Um, and then that road just continued to develop uh, as I moved into high school. The confusion was still there, but I realized I was dating girls. I didn't have a problem dating girls. I didn't have a problem making out with girls. Um, I wasn't anxious to go beyond that, but I would. But when I really got in my head about, oh, what am I really wanting? Oh, I, my best friend was somebody I was totally crushing on. There were some other guys in school that I was crushing on, but I couldn't go there. It's like I knew it was there, but I couldn't go there. And um, in fact, one of the most impactful moments of my life was graduation weekend. And I remember my best friend and I saying goodbye to each other because we were both going to different colleges. I remember I was sobbing, like sobbing, like <laughs> unbelievable sobs. And he just kind of looked at me like, what the hell, man? What's your deal? And when he looked at me, that's when I realized this wasn't just about friendship. This was like I was losing my first love. Hmm. And that's when I crossed that. I think that's the first time I actually crossed over into that thought process because I realized it. I realized there was something there. And then the doors opened because I went away to college, 1,500 miles, well, not quite 1,500 miles, about 900 miles away from home. And, you know, college, you're on your own, you get to start doing things. And I started to dabble. I started to like try to figure this out. I was, it was ironic because as soon as I got to college, there was another guy that looked exactly pretty dang close to my best friend. And immediately I had a crush on him and started hanging out with him more and trying to figure out, okay, what's going on. And suddenly I was surrounded by some guys that I could tell now that I can, you know, roll the time back and look at it and go, Oh, let's look at la that part of life through this, you know, this little microscope. There was a whole group of us that were trying to figure all this out. Hmm. And I was in dance. I wasn't, well, I wasn't supposed to be in dance because some of the Adventists aren't supposed to dance, but I was sneaking off campus going to dance school in downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee. And um, I was doing theater productions on campus. And pretty much everybody that I was involved with, it's so ironic that most of the guys now that I've ran across since then, we're all out of the closet every one of us, but all of us in that moment, we're trying to figure it out. And um, so it was a pretty impactful point in time. Mm. And that's when I finally decided, <clears throat> um, I think it was my second year in college to finally come clean with my parents. And it didn't go well. Um, it was definitely, nope. You're not going to be this. You're not going to go down this path. This is against God's will. And I'm like, well, this is interesting. Now suddenly <laughs> we're good church going people. We weren't that for all these years, mom and dad. Um, but it was interesting. Uh, I'm just going to like leave it there and see where you want to go from here. Because I could go. I could just go now and I could take you all the way. But, um, Rick, I wanted to ask you a question. It it seems to me taking it just a little bit back, um, mm -hmm. a sexual awakening, as you put it at five or six or yep. even younger, it was five or six. I don't understand. I, I, I'm not sure I can relate to that. So, so maybe you could just okay, sure. tell us a bit. more. So I had an older individual in my life who sexually abused me literally 
taught me everything there was about having sex with a man. And the reason I don't, cons it's a toughie because I usually get in trouble here with people who are about sexual abuse. It was sexual abuse. Hands down, that's what it was. For me, it was a sexual awakening. It was a moment I finally realized, oh, wow, I'm kind of understanding why I look at men the way I do and why I find certain things fascinating. Even at five and six years old, this probably went on until I was at least seven. Um, it helped me start to understand, wait, these things I'm feeling make sense now. Mm. Where I don't agree with what happened is that that person had no right to take that away from me at that age. Mm. It's not anybody else's business when you choose to be sexually awakened other than yourself. Mm. And even when I talk on stage about this, which is basically what I'm doing right now is sharing that anybody who says, Oh, someone's gay because they were sexually abused. I will fight that. And I will fight it hard. There's very few cases psychologically that you can prove that that's what's happened. I don't believe in pedophilia at all. I think it's one of the worst crimes and those people should be persecuted, jailed, whatever for what they do because no one has the right to sexually awaken another person unless that person is willing to go there. And that's the key phrase, willing to go there. Mm. <clears throat> A child of five or six can't willingly go there. Now, in my case, I said I understood stuff. That doesn't mean I was willing to go there, but now I understood some stuff that was going on. I don't think anybody has the right to take that away from me. I don't care if you are 20 something and still a virgin, if you are 30 something and still a virgin, nobody has a right to take that away from that person. That person has the right to determine when they choose to become sexually active, sexually, you know, involved, whatever that is. Because to me, the sexual awakening is such a beautiful piece of being a human being that it's just like coming out. Nobody has a right to out somebody else. That journey is their journey, just as a sexual awakening is each and every person's journey. I feel blessed in a weird way that that happened for me because it only helped to help me understand things when I needed to so that I could move through life and do things in the way that I needed to. And it's interesting that it happened at that age and then I had this awakening at 19 that, okay, I know I'm gay. And then I went back in the closet because what it was, was each step was building the foundation for me to become stronger and stronger, and more mature and more able to finally stand where I stand today and say, this is me, bitches. You take it or leave it. You know, this is the way life is. Um, was it easy? At times, no, because it was very conflicted. It's like, okay, I enjoyed what was happening with that person, but then everybody around us is like, this is wrong. And so that conflict is what I think happens for many young gay people, especially once they start to hit eight, 10, 12, and they start to move into, okay, we're going through our puberty, so to speak. If those messages are really strong, all that does is cause more conflict and you can't figure out who you are. And I love to share this piece of it because where I think the parallel comes into place is as a heterosexual person, if the message was, but that's wrong, how different would your life be right now today? Hmm. If your feelings for someone of the opposite sex were told, but that's wrong you would be a completely different person. In fact, almost everything in life that you would do would be completely different because you would carry this load on your back of everything I do is wrong. And this is where I find it so fascinating when I work with people, not just in the coming out world, like true sexual identity, gender identity coming out. When I work with someone who's like struggling in life, it's about digging in under this and going, okay, so talk to me, you know, Craig, <laughs> about how you perceive yourself as a masculine guy because something in there is actually going to be a piece of what's holding you back from being fully yourself 
whatever those constraints, those constructs that have been laid on you as men or women are actually the same sort of things that were laid on to me as a gay man to say, ooh, I can't be this. And each of us carries this stuff. And I believe, just in the work that I've done, that a lot of this happens because we get defined in roles of masculinity and femininity, and then we carry them forward in everything that we do, how we interact with each other, how we meet people at a conference, how we strike up conversations about being on someone's podcast. Every bit of this comes from some way of how we've defined ourselves as who we are and our masculinity, femininity, who we see ourselves determines that. I'm very secure in my masculinity and I think you guys knew that because I was really open about here's who I am and this is who I am. But that's because I've worked at this to become that way in public and it doesn't hold me back any longer. So that's why I enjoy bringing this piece of myself up is because I think it opens a doorway that sometimes somebody listening is going to go, I never thought of that. Mm. So now what is it me? What's in me? What's in my identity of who I am as a man or in my masculinity or as a woman and in my femininity that's holding me back because somebody said, this is how a woman acts. This is how a guy acts. This is what it means to be masculine or feminine. It brings it home. Certainly. Wow. So Rick, is this person still in your life? They are, um, they're still alive. I don't interact with them. Um, they're part of the family. So I will occasionally interact. Um, there was some forgiveness stuff that happened. Um, I don't purposefully go seeking any interaction, not because I dislike the person. I just, there's no reason to. Um, and I have my, I have my own, things around that, that I think this person is still hiding who they really are. But at this point they're approaching, you know, their later years. So everybody comes to it in their own way. So if I were to go to something where they were, I wouldn't, I wouldn't not talk to them. Um, but I don't purposely go seek it out. Did you feel it was, bad or naughty or something like that at the time? Yes and no. At the time that it happened, no. I thought, oh, this is interesting. This is fun. This is, again, it, this is what made me understand some things. But then people would swoop in and go, this isn't right. So then I'm like, okay, well, wh what do you mean this isn't right? Help me. You know, I'm five, six years old. Help me understand what's not right. So people uh, knew this was going on. Yes. And they, they, they would stop it and then it would happen again and they would stop it and they would, you know, and finally it did stop. Finally, it just was like, okay, done. Um, I think for this person, it was their own immaturity simply because this person was a teenager and I was a five, six year old kid. So it wasn't like this was like, you know, they hadn't quite got to adulthood, but by the time it ended, they had crossed the boundary into adulthood. Um, so it, it kind of begs the question, does it, is this just childhood play or is this something that goes beyond it? And I think this is where that's in an interesting conversation. If it's, you know, guys, you know, doing what guys do or girls doing what they do and they're under 18, just because they're under 18, if you're 12 or 14 or 15 and this other person's five or six, where does that happen? You know, where do you define it? And um, those are the things I don't really even debate with anybody. I'm like, it happened. I'm cool with it. I'm good with it. I've shared how I feel about it. Um, I don't agree with it, but I know what it did for me and how it helped me position myself. Especially now, I can really hold this space. And I'll never forget the first time I ever talked about it. And it was only, uh, only a few years ago that I actually brought this up for the very first time. And I was standing in front of a group of college students um, in a sexuality class, human sexuality class. And there was about 200 kids in the room. And I knew how to talk my story. I knew how to tell my story about my coming out, my Google coming out, you know, all that sort of stuff, being married, having kids. And for some reason, I looked into the audience and there was a young man sitting there. And I had barely said anything. And he was sitting there and there were some tears going down his face. 
and I just kind of froze for a minute. It's weird that I freeze because rarely I can like find something and I'm like, okay, it's not that I'm screwing up and not forgetting, but it was rare that I would actually like, I am stopped. Hmm. And just the way I looked at that young man, for some reason, it felt like a reflection of myself at a very young age. And it just came out. I said, you know, there's another piece of my story that I want to share because I think it's vital to break through a belief about homosexual men. Because some homosexual men have been sexually abused and some homosexual men have been introduced to sex at an age that's inappropriate. And I am one of those guys, hmm. but that isn't what made me gay. It's what helped me understand who I was as a gay young boy. And it just, I was shocked that I even said it because I, I had vowed to myself, this is one piece that I don't know that I'll ever talk about, but it was such a release because it mm. now is part of the story. And it's, it's a power. I feel like it's a powerful piece of the story to help take away something that some in society say, this is why people are gay. No, very rare. I, I mean, I have psychology friends who are like, it's very rare that the sexual abuse leads to this. If anything, most of the time it leads people away from this because they don't want it. You know, they don't want to have anything to do with someone of the same sex. So, uh, but I mean, yeah. little girls are sexually abused. Little boys are sexually abused by women. I mean, it, it, it almost seems to have no bearing in my mind on that because mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it can happen to boys and girls and yeah. you know, I'm sure that doesn't, determine your sexuality just because you were abused even right. if you were a little girl for example by a man and are you heterosexual because of that no exactly exactly yeah and the thing that's the thing that i find most powerful in this is when people can work through it and they can say this is what happened because it helps other people go i'm okay there's a me too to this, you know, the me too movement is huge. And I want to take away from the me too movement. But the thing that I love about the me too movement at this point, at least in my mind, is it's opened the doors to so many ways people can say, oh yeah, me too. Whether it's about the sexual abuse, whether it's about, I don't have any confidence, whether it's about, I see myself as a man, but I don't feel masculine. Um, there's so much to this me too movement that I feel like has opened a door and I'm opening a door with some of the stuff I'm doing with men and masculinity. I mean, there's so many men who like, I don't feel like I'm masculine like other guys. And I just did a, a whole program in Portland this summer, uh, a meetup at a conference with this. And I had 36 guys show up and it was men and masculinity in a me too world. And the whole point of it was to show how many Me Too stories there are without taking away from the Me Too movement. But as men, there were 36 guys that stood there and in their own way said, yeah, I don't feel like I'm a masculine guy. And some of these guys were butch. Like, I'm looking at them going, uh, you're way <laughs> masculine, man. But they didn't feel it. And so I, I just find this whole thing so interesting. Um, I wish we could all really hear each other's Me Too's <laughs> because I think then the world would be a different place. Yeah. Wow. I love it. I'm almost like yeah. sitting here, like, I don't know, my heart's beating a little bit more. It's like pretty deep. It's great. Um, so Rick, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, what was it like telling your parents and hearing them say, no, this is wrong? Um, frustrating. Um, Almost like, okay, I don't, I don't feel being heard. I don't feel like, again, that I'm being heard by you about something. And um, it was a tough space simply because when this all was going down, um, my dad's oldest brother was gay is gay, whatever you want to call it. He's no longer with us either. And 
it was shortly after I came out to my parents that he was diagnosed with HIV and AIDS. Mm. So simultaneously, you have a family member in the hot in the heights of we don't know what this thing is. You know, this is happening to gay men. He lived in San Francisco, and simultaneously, oh, our son is coming out of the closet and saying he's mm. gay you can't be this. So I know there was a mixture of things going on. You know, there was the, Oh my God, it's my kid. No, you can't be this, the religious stuff, the unknown. And, um, I was angry and frustrated because not only did I not feel heard, but I didn't feel understood. I was crying really out for someone to say, I need help understanding this. Help me figure this out. And I don't feel like that's what I got. I got, you can't be this because this is what, quote, the Bible says, and this is what society says. And I have to say in defense of my parents, they did the best with what they had. And again, this was early 80s. So this was a different lifetime ago. Even as much as from the 80s back to the 60s and the 50s, people who would have tried to come out, it was a complete different lifetime ago. So we're pre-Ellen, I think the only gay character that probably even really existed in media at that point was probably Jack Tripper on Three's Company and (laughs) gay men were being like (laughs) positioned as these flamboyant da 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 da. And um, I feel very blessed that my parents helped me go back in the closet, so to speak, because I do know if I had come out of the closet fully, I don't believe I'd have this conversation with you guys. Hmm. I think there's a high probability that I would have come out. I would have either ended up on the street. Maybe. I don't know that my parents would have gone that far. Um, I probably would have turned more to alcohol than I already was as a college kid experimenting with it. I know I was sexually immature. I didn't really know anything to do with gals except let's kiss. Let's, you know, try to get to second base. Uh, with a guy, I was like, okay, so I know I'm attracted to this, but how do, what do guys do? You know, I know I wanted that, but how does that all work? You know? Um, and then they sent me to therapy. I don't even call it therapy counseling with the pastor at the church Hmm. and great guy. He was, he was the pastor that I admired the most in our church, um, at the college. And he just happened to be really good looking. So nothing worked because I just sit there and look at him going, you're just really hot. (laughs) And it's like counterproductive here, folks. You know, I mean, then I started feeling really guilty because I go to church and, you know, I was sitting in his office and I was all turned on. And now, gosh, he's clear up there on the pulpit. And, you know, it just, it was, it was a sickness (laughs) on my mind. uh, It also helped me. I think it also helped me break through some of that religious stuff. I'm like, because, I don't remember everything he and I talked about, but there was a piece of him that he wasn't judgmental. He was just, here's the belief system. And I do remember, and it's so interesting that now I'm a coach because I'll use questions like this or statements like this. I remember him saying, I invite you to explore this, to explore these concepts. And of course, as a coach, I'll say that to a client. You know, I invite you to explore this because I think this might be the exploration you need. And so here's where the hinges all start (laughs) coming together, you know, and there's points in life, I believe, where suddenly you go, oh, wow, I heard that phrase. I would have never thought that that would connect to something. But here's a phrase he said to me in the 80s that now I use with coaching my clients. uh, I invite you to explore this. And so to me, it's so interesting that life weaves these webs and we go, I don't feel like I'm going anywhere. I don't get why all this is connected, but it all is very interconnected. I can actually connect a lot of what I do in my current career from everything that I've been, everything from a VP of marketing and branding to, you know, being a food service director, there are pieces of this. I go, yeah, I I learned this as a food and beverage director that now helps me in this. And it's so interesting and fascinating when you step back, take pause and really look at why you are where you are instead of, okay, why am I here? And you don't even stop to really think through why you're asking that question. I invite myself and people to go explore Why are you here? Think about everything that's happened that got you to this space. And those moments with that pastor, I believe, helped get me to this space of 
in a weird way, I'm doing pastoral work with my clients. What is it you want? Why do you believe what you believe? If you could change that belief, who would you become? If you no longer bought into that story, what would be different for your life a year from now? Whether you're coming out of the closet or you're going to start a podcast or whatever it might be, those are big questions. And I don't think we as humans sometimes give ourselves permission to ask the big questions. Yeah. Wow. It's uh, like I said, it's uh, very, very powerful stuff. It's all questions that we should be asking ourselves uh, all the time and auditing ourselves as we, we spoke about a little bit earlier. Uh, it's so important uh, in life to do. Now you've been seeing this pastor and you had this sort of interesting uh, relationship with him uh, because you kind of had this attraction to him, but you were still kind of found him quite a interesting guy and, and probably, you know, took on board quite a lot. What he, what he said, how yep. did that transition you, you ended up, actually sort of listening to what he had said and taking a lot of that uh, to heart and, and implementing some of the things he suggested or how did that transition happen at that phase of your life? Well, I went and had some drinks and said, okay, we need to think about this. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the thing too in life is, you know, you got to have some fun with this. You got to realize, wow, this, this hill, this bump in the road, yeah, it's a pain in the ass, but okay, so what can I do with this bump in the road? And for me, what I realized, even in those moments, is like, wait, I don't, I don't think I'm ready yet. I know I'm not ready. So I started actually dating girls more, and I enjoyed being with girls. I still enjoy being with women, not sexually necessarily, but I enjoy the company of women and, and hanging out and having really good conversations. And what I started to discover was this pause in my life was so I could grow, so I could have some fun. I started actually enjoying my college life, probably a little more than I should have on a few drunken nights, but you know, hey, I was, I, I had, it was almost like, okay, I see this, so let's put this here, even though some people say, oh, that wasn't the best thing to do. For me, that was the best thing to do. I'm putting this over here, and now I'm moving forward. I'm gonna have fun, I'm gonna date, I'm gonna become one of the guys, guys, and even though, once I changed colleges, it was a little harder to feel like I was a guy's guy. I started hanging around with the guy's guys. And then it was like, okay, there was still that thing I'm hiding, but it was much easier because I realized right now I'm just, I'm not fully baked. I'm not in, in the gay bakery. I'm not ready to be the wedding cake. Okay. <laughs> it's not happening yet. Um, what was happening was, okay, I had to learn some more stuff. I had to learn how to be with people. I had to learn how to start standing up for what I believed in. I had to learn to guide my own cart. So when I switched schools, I had started down a path of being a dietitian. And then I got to my new school and I'm like, I don't want to be a dietitian. I want to be like the guy running the bar. I want to be the guy running the restaurant. And so I actually switched gears and I went into um, hotel restaurant management, still ended up with a dietetics degree, but I had a dietetics and hotel restaurant management degree. And that was a thing that was kind of fought by my parents. You can't do that because, you know, this is our beliefs and we don't do this. And I was like, okay, I'm done with your beliefs, mom and dad, because I'm an adult, I'm doing this. And I'm so glad that I did because even though this one piece of Rick was sitting over here on the shelf, that little piece, when I kind of came to terms with it for the time being, released energy for me to start going and doing other things. It released the energy for me to go, okay, I'm going to go do this in my career instead of what mom and dad think I should do. And I'm going to do these sort of things. I'm going to stand up to some people at, at, in different places. I actually became pretty forthright in a many areas of my life. Um, and what I found is I enjoyed that, which again, now here's the dot. I'm very much that way now. I'm very forthright. I don't really hide anything from anybody. I'm careful where I say certain things, but for the most part, what you see is what you get. I'm very transparent. And I started learning all that in college. And then I started learning as I got into my first work. And I remember three years into my first work, my boss came to the college that I was running the food and beverage thing. And he goes, so we got to get started for the new school year. And I said, yeah, there's no we in this. There's a you in this. I'm done. I've got another job. 
because this isn't where I'm supposed to be. And I remember him looking, and this was, okay, it was a really shitty thing I did. It was two weeks before school started. And like, okay, now they got to find a new food and beverage director. But had I not learned to start taking control of my life then, I don't think I would have at 36 taken control of my life with my sexuality and been where I got to. Hmm. But because I took the pause with the pastor, I put it on the shelf, it gave me the energy to do other things because all those other things I started to learn to do were the building blocks. Even though what I did was a really shitty thing to a very wonderful woman, those building blocks helped me finally stand true in myself at age 36. And I believe those are the things that continue to help me stand true in myself at now 55. So Rick, I, I always, um, listen intently to people's stories and you know their their journey and how they look at it now and i often think that people kind of forget about what they were like at the time you know and do you think it was really like that was it really that easy for you to sort of cop you know compartmentalize something and just move on and use this energy in other ways like surely it must have been much more difficult than that Yes and no. I found that putting that piece over there was the easy part. Okay, this is going over here. I'm not ignoring it. I know it's there. The hard part was this is over there. I know it's there. And now I got to keep it hidden. The moving forward was easier. Yeah, let's go pursue career. Let's do it. Because guess what all that did was that all became the armor. Everything was the defense system so that this over here didn't get found out. So the hard part was keeping that hidden. The rest of it was actually pretty easy. Throw myself into work, met the gal, got married. We were on the career track, both of us. I mean, we were married um, nine years, eight years, nine years before we even embarked on parenthood. That little thing over there was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life to keep it hidden because there were so many stories I had to keep straight. Mm. I would go out and this is not anything I'm proud of, but it's part of the story. It's part about being transparent. It's part about helping people go, whatever that story is you're hiding, it's going to kill you because living a double life, and having sexual encounters on the side, whether you're gay or straight, whether it's a, an affair or a one night stand, that shit will kill you. Hmm. Because you're putting pressure on your body. You're putting pressure on your psyche. You're putting pressure on your belief in yourself every time that happens. And I think so many people miss that. Yes, in the moment, nothing felt better. Trust me, nothing felt better for me than having an experience with the guy until I walked back out the door. Hmm. And then I had to check, okay, do I have all my stuff? Am I cleaned up? Did I do anything that was unsafe? What's the story gonna be? How am I going to get past it if something comes up? Talk about pure hell. That five, 10, 15, 30 minute drive home or back to work was always the worst, but then I had to walk in the door. And once in the door, oh, here's Rick, the great guy that's doing this and all, with that little secret sitting over there. And I don't think people see how much damage that sort of stuff does. And for me, it was damage of unhealthy living. I was a big guy, and you guys have both met me. I'm a tall guy. So put a hundred pounds on the body that you saw when you met me, that's yeah. who I was. Wow. But it was part of hiding the truth. Yeah. I hid in food. I would say I hid in alcohol, but I wasn't an alcoholic. I never got to that point. I did not wake up in the morning and go, I gotta have a drink. But I enjoyed my drinks. And when I came out of the closet, the most extreme thing that happened was extreme weight loss. I went from over 300 pounds to 190 wow. in six months. Jeepers. 
and people saw me, people who knew me, my parents being one of those who was not happy with the coming out. And they're like, well, I wish you'd just admit that you're HIV positive. So that was their blueprint for my uncle. That was not the case whatsoever. Even my husband, when he met me and we have pictures of me, he's like, yeah, I wasn't sure if you were healthy or not because I was so extreme in that difference. And here's the interesting piece. And I hope your listeners will really take this one in. It doesn't matter to any story that somebody says about coming out, whether it's coming out sexually, coming out to admit I've been having an affair, whatever that is, as soon as you admit to that, there's going to be some other piece of life that you shed. Because somehow, some way, whatever you've been doing, you found a way to hide using food, alcohol, throwing yourself into work, avoiding friendships, having too many friendships, not having deep friendships, having too deep of friendships. There's something you're going to find, and it's so interesting and fascinating to me with every journey I work with someone on, whether it's sexually or leaving a corporate job, we'll get about three to six months into the work and then send there like, yeah, I don't want to do this either. And I can almost feel it coming because I can see the progress they're making and I can see it happening. And then whoosh, this is the thing they want to do next. I've had people come out of the closet sexually and the next thing I know they're leaving a job. I've seen them come out of a job and the next thing I see them is they want out of the relationship they're in. I've seen people be working on getting out of deep debt and the next thing they do is they go take the biggest risk of their life and they go, I know I'm in deep debt, but I'm also going to leave my company because I want to start something myself. It's all about shedding whatever it is that's hiding the truth. And every time I work with someone, there's some other piece of truth that they shed simultaneously. Um, that's really shocking. Hmm. Just wanted to ask you, you said there was a part of you that was, you it, you'd put it aside, right? Yep. Did you call it something? Did you know I am a gay man, or was oh, it yeah. like, or I'm I knew just exactly you who know I, was. What I mean? Like, was it was yeah, it yeah. like a very specific thing that you had identified in your mind? <clears throat> or? Yeah, I knew I was. I wouldn't know that I would say gay. I knew that I enjoyed the sexual experiences with men, and that's what got said over here. I wouldn't say I was gay, but I knew I enjoyed being with men. Wow. Now, I am one of those guys, uh, you know, so I didn't say gay guys. I'm one of those guys, I'm one of those men who never had an issue in the sexual arena with a woman. I didn't go after it like, I, like a lot of guys do in high school and college, but I never had an issue with it. And there's a lot of gay men who are like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Keep that thing away from me. I'm not touching that. <laughs> da, 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 da. You know, that's not me. You know, in fact, it's kind of funny when I know there's like a hyper heterosexual in the group. I just love to like annoy the hell out of them by like really being flirty with women. They're like, uh, hello, why are you with all the great looking gals? I'm like, because they trust me, bro. They know nothing's going to happen here. Okay. But um, it wasn't something that held me at bay. But it was something I knew this was a part of it. And as the years went by, I knew it more and more and more. I just couldn't get past the fact there were a couple of things that had always held me back. One was marriage. I didn't think I could ever have a married or long-term relationship with a man. I just, even though I had the model of my uncle and his partner, I mean, I can remember them from, when I was a little kid, they were always around. They were still the family's quote, kind of, let's not talk about it. We'll accept that they're here, but we don't talk about it. And so that was part of what held me back. That blueprint was like, do yeah. I, you know, subconsciously, even as a young person, as a young adult, and even into my thirties, it's like, hmm, do I want that? Is that what I want to be known for? But then there was, can I actually have a relationship with the guy? It's easy. Okay, come on guys, all of us listening, you guys too it's easy to go have sex with someone. That's the easy piece. Okay, maybe it's a challenge to get there, but you know, if we really want it, we can make it happen. It's the relationship that takes the work. And I honestly didn't believe I could have a relationship with a guy. And the third piece of that was, I didn't believe gay men could have kids. 
Now that is not why I had my children. I always wanted to be a parent. And that is not why I married my wife, knocked her up twice, because I didn't knock her up. We had children, okay? It pisses me off when people use the term knock them up. Because it's like, oh yeah, I did that. You know, mm, me, you know, look what I did. Please guys, get over yourself. Um, but those are my belief systems. And then when things started to unravel, I realized all three of those belief systems were complete bullshit. However, you have to think back to the time frame when this was all starting for me at the younger time in life. All three of those belief systems were pretty much the belief systems of the world. You can't be married. You, gay people don't have long-term relationships. All gay men do is, you know, they have sex with each other like anywhere. You know, they'll have sex in the in the you know confessional at church. They'll you know, they'll do this in a parking lot where, but you know, all this stuff and to have children, whoever heard of, you know, even though it was happening at that time, but whoever heard of gay people having children. And so you got that, the relationship thing, all of this stuff was like so ingrained on top of it as it's a sin and this isn't normal until I started realizing, wait, I'm not so sure on it any of this is true or at least some of it for sure isn't true for me and it's so interesting how the higher powers of life whatever that means to you for me it's the universe brings you what you need when you need it and what 36 is when i got brought what i needed to really take all the blueprints, all the beliefs, and even my own value system into focus. Even though I know I was a son of a bitch to have done in some ways what I did to the woman that I broke a heart. It was when and all of us, even my kids, and there's some regrets I have around that, could handle it. My biggest regret with my kids is my youngest one. She has no recollection of mom and dad ever being mom and dad together. Mm. Because she was nine months old. But I believe because of who they are today, and they're, my kids are 19 and 23, they wouldn't be the beautiful kick-ass women they are had they not had this as part of their experience in life. And I'm not justifying my actions because of that. I'm just saying the universe, God, source, whatever you want to call it, gives each of us exactly what we need to do the journey we're doing. Hmm. Rick, um, I definitely want to hear more about that. But, but I'd also like to find out, right, how, how did you sort of go home and, you know, I guess, be with your wife after these interactions. And surely, you know, I mean, women have a sixth sense. And was she not picking anything up? Was she not asking any questions? How did that all work? That's a really good question because I would go home and I was very connected but I was very disconnected when it came to the sexual realm. I could have sex. I could enjoy sex with her or with guys. And the ironic piece is, and I, I mean, even as I'm about to say it, I start to feel it already. It's as if it's an out of body experience, not anymore, but it used to be. I could be in those situations and the moment it started to happen, it's if, a piece of me just completely left and was almost the observer. It's like, okay, your, your body's doing this. It's making that happen. The emotional piece and everything is kind of there, but not really. And as soon as it was done, it's like, okay, Rick, pack up, put your clothes on. Oh, okay. Now I'm in the emotional into, you know, intellectual piece of me then steps back into the body. And now we go home. It was very strange when I would be home and we would be in that space as a couple and the same thing would start to happen Whoosh, this piece of me would just kind of step out okay we're doing this again so here's the mechanics of it 
make it happen, do it. Da, 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 da. Okay, we're done, bring it in. However, I loved her. I cared deeply about her. But when it came to that piece, I, it was almost like there was two pieces of me. And I've had other people talk about something very similar. It's like, yeah, I completely could disconnect, which was always a challenge. As far as keeping the story straight, that was actually the biggest challenge. As far as whether she knew, there are conversations we've had since then that she indicated she was curious. Um, she's never blatantly come out and said, I knew, because my judgment of that is that's a hard thing for someone to admit. I knew my mm -hmm. spouse was cheating on me. I knew my spouse was this. Because there's a piece of yourself then that you have to go, you have to go confront. You have to go, well, if you knew this, then why were you willing to be here? Um, I think anytime you deal in infidelity or things such as that, even though you may not be the one who did it, if you felt it and you didn't act on the question, because that's a big question to go face. Mm. That's a big accusation to go make. And for some people, they don't want to hear the answer. Because if they hear the answer, then what is, what's going to happen to me? How do I feel about myself? What did I do? Am I not good? You suddenly go into your own head, because that's what we do as humans. It's like, oh, wow, you didn't want to be with me. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not strong. Enough. What? it suddenly becomes about you, even though you're pissed off. You want to make it all about them. Yes, they're the ones who did this. But every time we do that, think about that with any relationship. I don't care if it's work or sex or whatever. As soon as we kind of go, okay, yeah, I knew this was happening. It's like, okay, I kind of knew I was probably going to get laid off. Well, if you knew, then what did you not do about that? What could you have done? Maybe you weren't going to do anything about it because you couldn't do anything. But maybe if you felt it, now you could have been preparing for if this is going to happen, I'm not going to get caught with no job. We all do this stuff. For me, I think it was just so much I was powered by that this is the only way I can survive. This is the only way I can get through a day. This is the only way I can feel like there's some little piece of me, this little piece over here on the shelf, that's actually alive. And if I only get to experience that once or twice a week, maybe once or twice a month, well, hey, I'm living a pretty full life because I've got everything else over here. I get this once in a while. And then it all changed because I realized that wasn't what it was all about. Hmm. Before we get to that, Rick, obviously I want to ask you that, but just who would initiate the sexual encounters with you and your wife like how, how do you get to that point if you're actually not there well i was never not attracted to her and i was never not turned off by sex i'm a sexual one thing i will say is i'm a sexual being i know that about myself and even to this day and age even though i'm married i have a husband now <laughs> People will say, well, so are you not attracted to women? I said, I've never said I'm not attracted to women. And if the right stars aligned in the right situation, I'm not saying that that couldn't happen again. It's just I know for me, my disposition is I find men highly attractive. Um, I find everything about guys really attractive. But I also find women very attractive too. It's in a day-to-day -day situation, living, breathing, doing life with someone, which at some point includes the sexual piece of it, I'm more predisposed to do it with a guy mm. than a woman. And I think that's hard for some people to wrap their head around. It's like, okay, well, wow. But it's really not that difficult. <laughs> if each of us says, who am I more predisposed to doing life with? Your answer is probably gonna be whatever your sexuality is. And for some people, it's gonna be bisexual. For some people, it's gonna be asexual. They don't need anything for some people it's going to be very open there's going to be polyamorous life where they're more intellectually connected to people and they have an intellectual relationship with them they'll have a sexual relationship with someone else and they'll have a day in day out living relationship with someone else this is where to me the whole world of gender and sexuality is very fascinating and it's also where 
it can be a head explosion for many people because they're like, I guess I can't wrap my head around this. Mm -hmm. I know for me, any given day of the week, I'm going to be much more predisposed to men than women. And then when you're a father of two girls, that makes that even easier. Because you're like, no, there's way too much drama with women. But uh, <laughs> if I, I have to be honest, guys, there's way just about as much drama with guys. So if guys don't think they're drama queens. I'm like, I think men are bigger drama queens than women are. So, uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean you have to be gay either. You know, it's really, it's just <laughs> as big a drama queen. So, so Rick, uh, this little guy that's sitting out there, how, yeah. how did he all of a sudden come to life? Like... It's a good story around that, I guess. Yeah, that's the big story. Um, and it, it happened because of a blimey Brit. So here we go. Um, <laughs> I was in the UK. I was working in the UK off and on for about six years. And this was in the height of everything starting to like shift. And um, again, the universe handed me the situation. The universe put me in a company that was very accepting, uh, a majority, a good majority, I would say 30 to 40% of our teams were gay or lesbian. Uh, it was a hotel company that we did software for hotels around the world. And so I was surrounded by people like me that I wasn't being. And I happened to be in a space where I did a lot of traveling with a lot of these people. And each trip I got more and more comfortable being more myself, being on you know trade show floors and all this sort of stuff with my, what I now call my gay and lesbian brothers and sisters. And I felt comfortable with them. I, I felt comfortable joking and laughing about stuff with them, about their lives. Although it was in the auspices of, oh, he's the straight guy that just is really cool with being with, you know, gays and lesbians. And um, things were starting to progress. My reality was starting to come into focus. And I was in London and went out one evening by myself. Uh, everybody else was already out. I had gone to a I had gone to a trade show award dinner and I was the only one of our team that was going. Um, and I came back to the hotel and I was really looking forward to just going to bed. And I noticed when I came in the hotel, nobody was in the lobby. Typically my crew would be like, they're all at the bar, you know, but nobody was there. And this was in the days before cell phones and, or we had them, but they were horribly expensive. So to really the only way to get a hold of anybody was our sky pagers. And I thought, you know what? I'm not even going to try to get a hold of anybody. This is my night to go crash. I mean, we've been three days into a trade show. This was like third trade show in like a month, two international. And I'm like, I'm white. And as the universe has a way of doing, she tapped me on the shoulder and she goes, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> You're going out. You're going out on your own. And I did. I went to Piccadilly area. I asked Gababi where it was a gay bar and scared me to death to even ask that question. And didn't the Bobby didn't even blink an eye. Yeah, I go down that street there, right? And um, I still remember standing outside that gay bar shaking like a leaf, which isn't the first time I've done this. I did it in, the, in college in Tennessee. I stood outside, I sat outside a gay bar and never went in, afraid to go in. Um, and now I'd been to gay bars with friends. I'd gone with my teens and stuff. I'd never gone to one by myself. And uh, it, the thoughts that were going through my mind, is like, if you go in, somebody's gonna catch you there. I'm like, who's gonna catch me there? If I walk in and some of the teens there, I'm like, I figured I'd find you guys here, even though they'd be like, how did you find us here? We didn't even know you know where the gay district was and everything, you know, all that stuff. Um, and I did, I walked in and I, I was shaking the entire time. I thought somebody's gonna catch me and tell my story and da, 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 da. And ironically, somebody did catch me. This really beautiful, handsome British guy caught me. And we started talking and laughing and I was literally about to leave the bar. 
And that wasn't what was in the cards. And we went out, we kept drinking, we went dancing, went to a place called Heaven. And then what I knew how to do happened. He's like, would you like to go back to my hotel? I'm like, sure. This I knew how to do. This I'd done, no big deal. <clears throat> and uh, I don't remember the name of the hotel, but I remember it was very swanky. We got there and he's like, let's get comfortable. And I'm like, sure. I knew what that meant. And he goes, no, just, you know, here's a robe. Get comfortable. I'm going to order some room service. I'm like, it's two in the morning. What do you mean room service? Oh, I have a, I have a private butler. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, I, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go big, I guess. So, uh, <laughs> and um, that was the night I truly, I truly saw something different. Um, it was the night there was no sex. I fell in love and I fell apart hmm. because there was no sex. Hmm. And because I connected with this guy on a totally different level than I ever had with anybody. And I walked out of that hotel room the next morning in a daze, having to get to the show going, you know, gosh, somebody's going to see me coming in the hotel at you know, back at my hotel, it's like, you know, 7.30 in the morning, I got to be to the show by this. And, you know, and I remember the whole day at the trade show, just, I felt like a little schoolgirl in love. And he and I were using our sky pagers to like text back and forth to each other, which was a pain in the ass with a sky pager. And those who don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Trust us. It was a pain to even communicate that way. Um, I got off from the show, we were packing up because it was just the next day I was flying back to the US and I was like truly like little school girl, like I gotta see you again. He's like, I can't, I've got stuff. I'm like, okay, I said, I don't leave till like, you know, three something in the afternoon, can we see? I was determined I was gonna see this guy again. And he's like, no, I don't think it's gonna work. And he goes, but I can see you when you get back. And it was so ironic because the entire evening, I know he had told me this, but I totally like, it just, it went somewhere in the back of my mind that he told me he was from San Francisco. Now he was British. So of course my, you know, stupid little US head is like, this is a Brit, he's a Brit, he's a Brit, he lives here, you know? Even though he had told me that this whole time, I'm like that piece of information keeps eluding me until he said, I'll see you when I get back in the States. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's not possible because when I get back to the States, I'm a married guy with two kids living in Irvine, California, not San Francisco, California. And then I got on the plane to fly home and I couldn't get it out of my head that this guy wanted to see me again when he got back. And this guy wanted to hold me and not have sex with me. And this guy wanted to talk about stuff that mattered to me and to him. And this guy changed everything. And I got home and I called my wife from the airport and I said, I'm home. I'll be home in a, you know, a couple of hours because I flew into LAX and it was a good two hour drive home. She goes, great, I can't wait to see you. And I said, yeah, I can't wait to see you either. And I don't know why, but the words just came out and said, and we need to talk. Hmm. Now, even though the entire time, this is one of the few times that usually I, you know, coming home from the UK, I would just like zone sleep the whole way. I did not sleep one bit. I sat there with a spiral notebook and I wrote down everything I was feeling, why I would po possibly come out of the closet again how I felt about this guy, what I was, I mean, there was a whole journal. And for whatever reason, again, the universe gave me that nudge and said, and we need to talk. And she goes, oh, is everything okay? I said, yeah, we'll talk about when I get home. And I, I realize now how unfair that was of me to drop a bomb like that. Because think about it, if somebody says something like that and then they want to talk yeah. about it, of course, what do you think, what are you gonna do? You're gonna, you're gonna think about that the whole way. Well, for me, the whole way, I'm like, crap, I just said this to her. I don't, I'm kind of like committed now. Now, of course, I could have changed the story, but I felt committed because I had spent so much time in the journey coming home, committed to this is it, Rick. You're done. 
you are done lying, you are done cheating, you're done doing so much of this. And um, I still remember at least a minimum of two times driving down that freeway that I saw big semi trucks right behind me in the next lane over and thinking, just turn the wheel. Just literally turn the wheel, man, and nobody will ever find out. Yeah. But the universe wasn't going to have it that way. And obviously, neither was I because I went home and I said, I love you, but I met somebody and I'm gay. Hmm. And I'm sorry. And who we are and what we are, I don't know what that's going to look like, but I can't do this. And uh, I was literally gone the next morning because she was like, we're done. And I totally respect that. And um, it was about a year, year of a lot of hard work between the two of us. Um, sold everything, restarted lives. Uh, I began to really find myself as a mature gay man. So, you know, as I use the word mature, because it taken from 19 to 36 to mature into it. And even then I was still a very much an Im immature gay man, but I was much more mature to be able to take the steps. And um, it was the first time in my life I realized if you're gonna do anything in life, do it because you love it and because you wanna have fun with life. And that was the first time I realized I wanted to have fun and I wanted to be who I was. And I can't believe that two little words, I'm gay, is what it took to bring that piece over here hmm. directly into focus. And um, I'm so glad it happened because everything I do now in life is because, in fact, there's a really good friend of mine who, I never realized I was going to steal somebody's stuff until she said this. I'm like, okay, I'm stealing that. <laughs> she said, everything I learned about life and business, I learned from Weight Watchers. And she was a Weight Watchers counselor. And I kind of stole it. Everything I learned about life and business, I learned from coming out of the closet. And I believe that in every bit of my being. Had I not come out of the closet, I don't think I'd know everything I do now about being who I want to be, living the life I want to live, going through the challenges that life throws you and going, it's just another freaking coming out journey, Rick. So come on, girl, put your heels on. Let's go. Let's get through it. Because that's what every day is. It's another coming out journey. Even today, talking to you guys, when this airs with your listeners, I'll come out to however many people listen to it again. And it's not about that. It's about every day is a beautiful opportunity to come out and be even more who you're meant to be. And uh, even when the shit storms of life hit, to me, it's like, that's just part of the journey, man. That's just part of coming out again. You're going to have some stuff that's going to trip you up. You're going to have some stuff that challenges you. You're going to have some stuff that says, oh my God, I can't do this. Well, of course you can't because the whole journey is about you're starting in that same space. You start in confusion. Every time, everything starts in confusion so that you can go get curious, build the courage, step into your confidence, commit to being what you're going to be, and then consistently go do it. That's the coming out journey. And I don't care if it's about sex. I don't care if it's about leaving a corporate job, about leaving a relationship, about starting your own business, about losing weight, about having kids. Every coming out journey starts with confusion and ends up at consistently showing up. I was confused about being a parent, but I consistently show up as being a dad. It's just part of who I am. And everything in between is part of that journey. Rick, I mean, just before we finish off, I just, I mean, your wife must have been so angry, so confused. Yeah. What, what, what was her response like that night? Like, did, did she cry? Was she shouting at you? What did you yeah. feel like? Was it a weight off your shoulders? Uh, all of the above and more. Um, 
And, you know, it wasn't just that night. I mean, there was, there was, I, I left to give her some space. And then when I came back because we had a nanny and we're like, okay, this isn't good for the kids. We need to like, you know, when money's becoming an issue and how are we going to do this? And we're selling homes. And I mean, it was back and forth, back and forth. There was moments of her like, okay, you can just live your life and can't we just stay together? And, and then there were moments of, I don't want to see you. And then there was moments of, I totally get you and back and forth, back and forth. Um, we went for many years, things being really good. Uh, now we're in a space where things aren't good again, but it has less to do with me coming out and more to do with other stuff that's shown up in life. But the thing is, is nothing in life is going to be easy and nothing in life is going to be as hard as you want it to be unless you choose it to mm. be that way. And there were moments that I realized I'm making this really hard. Then there were moments I'm like, she's making this really hard. Mm -hmm. And then there's moments that this is really easy. And then the next moment would be, this is really hard. And what I learned through all of that, because there were moments where I didn't talk to my parents for months and years at a time. And then there were moments we did. There were moments that my ex and I would get along really great. And then something would happen and we wouldn't talk to each other. Right now we're in that space and I don't know, I honestly don't know if it will ever repair from where we are right now. I'm assuming as the girls step into marriages and if they choose to have children or they go through, God forbid, they go through some divorces, I think there'll be some pieces of interaction. I mean, we've already had some graduations that were, we showed up, we did our thing, we left, but we don't interact. But I think these are the pieces of life where you go, okay, I get to choose how I want to be in this. And sometimes the best choice you can be is I'm going to choose not to be in this because that's the best choice for all of us to be in this. And I think if you can get to that place where you can consciously and mindfully see that and accept that's where you are, you save yourself a lot of pain. I still care for the mother of my children. I still think she's a good person. But I know right now the place we need to be is not in each other's life for the best of the family unit as a whole. And our daughters see that. And we've navigated to a place where that works for everyone. I'm not saying that'll be that way forever. But what pains me, especially in these kind of situations, is when people hang on to and harbor the ill will. It's every bit as stressful and hurtful and demeaning and physically harmful to yourself as a person when you can't let shit go. And not too many people really understand that until they do. If you're having trouble losing weight, if you have a lot of medical problems, if you can't sleep at night, if you're not being successful, if you always find yourself going, why me? Ask yourself, what do you need to let go of and what are you hiding? Because I can guarantee you, anybody who's listening to this, there's something you need to come out of and there's some layer of armor you've got around that closet. And until you let that go, you're gonna not sleep, you're gonna be under stress, you're gonna be telling two stories about your life, you're not gonna be happy, and you sure the heck aren't gonna be in a joyful place. Is it easy? Hell no. Is it worth it? Hell yes. Because I can tell you the stress of not living a double life has brought me the joy of living the life I get to live now, even when life's a shit storm. I'd much rather live in the shit storm of my life now than live in the shit storm of my life that was when I wasn't being who I was. And some people accuse me of being very transparent and very open. So be it then I'm not supposed to be in your life then. And I'm okay with that. But I'd much rather be open and transparent than pretending to be someone I'm not. Because when I'm pretending to be someone I'm not, 
I'm not happy, I'm not joyful, and I'm not living the life the way I want. So I would you know, invite people who are listening to this, and I'm not saying I'm some great guru, because trust me, I'm not. <laughs> I'm one of the world's biggest fuck ups, let's just be honest there, okay? But um, think about what it is you're hiding from. And is it really worth the stress? Is it really worth whatever it is you're fighting? Then to just say, okay, this is where I'm at. And I'm done being this because that's all the coming out journey is, is I'm done being this plain and simple. Wow. Now, Rick, what drives you now to forward before we finish off? What drives you to help others and help them find that armor and that thing in their life that's holding them back? The biggest thing I think is knowing that your own way of being in the world is your gift. It's your joy factor. And if you never get to truly experience that to the best of your ability, then why are you here? And I'd much rather see somebody say, I know exactly why I'm here because I found the way to be in the world in my way, in my joy, and experience life exactly how I'm supposed to, rather than hiding and living it by other people's expectations. And if I can help somebody do that quicker in their life, even if I have a client right now who is 60 years old and just coming out of the closet, and the first thing that person said was, I realize I still got life to live. But I'm going to live it my way. I'd much rather someone get to that at that point than never. And if I can be the facilitator, the instigator, the challenger, the support to help somebody do that, whether it be through my podcast, speaking on a stage, even going into a corporate environment and saying, okay, why isn't your company living life on your terms? Why are you doing this this way? What are you doing that holds people back in your team and they can't do this? And so there's no collaboration, there's no innovation, there's no you know, beautiful things happening because people are buttoned up and closed off in closets. If I can help open that so people can say, oh wow, we didn't see that, and they suddenly start to thrive, then I get to live life for what I feel is why I was put on the planet. Ironically, as my friend said, everything I learned about business and life, I learned from coming out of the closet. That just happens to be my thing. Well, bud, that's been a powerful chat indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, just before we finish off, uh, what is the best way for all of our listeners to find out about you? Uh, RickClemens.com is my website, and that's Rick, C L E M. ONS.com. So, um, and I want to say this podcast today is a perfect example, I believe, for your listeners about making bold moves and not being afraid to strike up conversations and connect with people and hear their stories and realize. You may meet a guy from down under and one from London and you're from the States and you never know where the conversation leads. But if we hadn't taken the risk, we would have never had to have a really amazing connection and conversation. <laughs> it's just, uh, you just couldn't have put it any better, Rick. You've got an amazing way. Thank you so much for today. It's been well, one of you. the most uh, moving and important chats that I've had. And I'm sure Gareth feels the same way. Thank you for sharing so openly and honestly. Uh, I'm very grateful for our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Yeah. And Rick, um, yeah, exactly what Craig just said. It's been a chat where I've just kind of sat here listening to you tell this story, which I can, Im I can, I, I can never imagine what it was like going through uh, this sort of life that you led, you know, like it must've just been a really difficult, difficult time for you. Um, but the most important thing that I think you're doing is speaking about it and speaking about all the parts uh, that make it up because there's so many people that can probably relate to each of those parts. 
mm-hmm. and are going to find so much value in wanting, like you said, just come out and be honest maybe with themselves now because of what you've said. Right. Uh, it literally is life changing, you know, to overcome those things that you're putting on your little shelf. Mm-hmm. So yeah, thank you so much for the chat. We really, really yeah. appreciate it. Absolutely. I enjoyed it and so glad I got to be a part of it. So yeah. cool, man. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Thank you. Um, All right. All right, guys. Touch. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Great connecting with you guys again. Have a good day and a good night. So there we go. <laughs> Thank <you>. Thanks <laughs> a lot. Next time. Okay. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Take it easy, buddy. Bye. Cheers, Bye. man. Bye. 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 Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll.